Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, thanks, thanks again for joining this uh, seminar series. Um, so today we're very excited to have uh, one of our people here working in the Royal Botanic Garden Sydney, James Cluxton, uh, who did his part of his PhD uh, at the University of Edinburgh and also shared with the, the Botanic Gardens in Sydney and just uh, joined us uh, back at the gardens to do a postdoc on uh, legumes with uh, funded by AVRS and collaborating uh, with Russell Barrett in particular. So without further ado, uh, James, all to you. Okay, so what I'm going to give you, this is kind of a rundown of what I actually did for my actual PhD itself. Um, so it's not about the current research and things, but pretty much all the PhD research is finished. We've got a couple of papers submitted for it, a couple of papers already published. So I'm just going to kind of give you a rundown of kind of what we found with this. Um, this is kind of population genetic. So some of it is theoretically in elements is technical, but I'm kind of going to try to explain this to you in the easiest possible terms to kind of explain. So it's all about understanding genetic diversity. So I'm going to give you a bit of background. I know you probably know the cycads a little bit, but the cycads as a whole are one of the oldest groups of plants that physically produce seeds, 250 million years old. So pretty old group of plants itself. Quite a big lineage that's distributed, have a very pantropical distribution. Basically, you can find cycads anywhere past the Tropic of Cancer. So around the Ruku Islands of Japan, you get species start to occur with the majority of species around the equator. Um, despite the diversity um, of cycads, worldwide they're under threat. For as far as the, for the IUCN red list goes, that cycads, cycads are the highest group of, group of organisms on the planet at the highest rate of extinction. And this is a concern for, of course, for conservation because some of these plants are pretty interesting, pretty cool plants. And we want to conserve them for future generations. But in order to conserve a species, it's important that we understand their genetic diversity. So Australia is a real biodiversity hotspot for cycads. We have, um, we have both families represented in Australia, Cycadaceae being um, monogeneric, containing just cycas, and then we have Zamiaceae, which in Australia contains Boinia macrozamia and Lepidozamia, which are both really quite diverse itself. And they have, cycas as a whole have quite a wide distribution, um, but it's about these biodiversity hotspots and things which are quite important to us. So the question is, is um, why do we use um, population genetics for cycads or, or for any group of plant in particular? Well, we can use it to identify individual species. So we can find, look for differentiations or look for separations between populations. And these separations between populations can allow us to isolate where we have a lack of gene flow to potentially see evidence of speciation. For example, the have you guys this the the, the 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 image just here? This is um, Cycas macronesica occurring in Guam, and this is basically showing showed a complete separation between the north and south of the island. No gene flow between those sides. And as I said, we can also use it to um, to conserve diversity, because if we can understand the genetic diversity of organisms there. How, how related they are, if they're going through elements of inbreeding and things. It really helps us to design um, conservation management plans to help combat this. Um, and yeah, and at the moment, um, there's no genomic studies published currently of cycads in Australia. Um, there is a more recent one done using standard sequencing approaches, but no using genomics itself. So this is one of our first study species just here. This is um, Cycas calcicola. This occurs within the Litchfield National Park and the Catherine region of the Northern Territory. It's quite a nice plant. So Cycas armstrongi, one of these really iconic cycad species that you can see all over Northern Territory. It's a really nice plant. It's semi-deciduous in habitat. So Cycas maconicae, this shares a lot of morphological characteristics with armstrongi. Um, but it's generally got a bit thicker leaf. The leaflets themselves are a little bit thicker and where it occurs, it tends to be less prone to um, becoming deciduous or at least seasonally deciduous. And this is a supposed hybrid between Cycas maconicae and Cycas 
um, Armstrong. And there's a relevance for this. So why did we choose these species to start? Or why did I choose these species? Well, in essence, they were morphologically distinctive, on paper at least. Um, that was quite important for us. We chose species, what I would consider to be iconic Australian species, Calcicola, um, Armstrongi, really. And also these species are not listed as really in danger um, as according to the IUCN and for red listing. This is quite important to us. And also we had some populations which were disjunct from others. So we could test whether or not we can see this on a genetic basis. And we had an interpacific hybrid between some of the species, particularly Marconicae and Armstrongi, and the population reachable by car. This was quite a big one for us because, um, of course, if it's going to take, what, a two-day hike um, to get to the population in Northern Territory, um, that limits your movability for some of these species. For example, I would have really liked to choose um, Cycas pruniosa, but the idea of taking a helicopter or like a five or six day hike on the nearest road seemed a little bit intractable to me in the heat, <laughs> at least. If you guys got any questions you go, please do ask. So one of the goals of the, the goals of this project were pretty easy, it was to document the genetic diversity of wild populations and for Cycas calcicola to assess if what we have in cultivation matches to what we have as the genetic diversity in the wild populations and to assess the hybrid status of Cycas meconicae dash um, of, of uh, between Cycas meconicae and Cycas armstrongi and to potentially find morphological characters for identification of populations. However, the morphological stuff I'm not going to cover in this presentation, um, but it is relevant, but I can explain that later on. Okay, so field work. So this was a pretty easy one, actually. We got quite a decent amount of samples. Um, ideally, you would probably want to get more, but the problem is in the, the method that we chose of sequencing, um, when, when I get to that, it, it's quite expensive. So we're limited for the number of individuals we can capture. And also, it's a PhD project, so we try to get as a few species as possible. So for Cycas calcicola, which is the blue, you can see this is the literal national park here. I'll just close this thing down a bit. And this is the, um, and this is the Catherine region. And then we also, for, for calcicola only, we also collected individuals from um, these two sites here that were obtained through cultivation. So for all of the samples we had, um, for Cycas calcicola, quite a good six populations, 60 samples, 10, um, um, Armstrongi a lot more because we had extra collecting efforts by other parties as well based in the Northern Territory Herbarium. Macarnake was also a good number of species and Armstrong and um, the hybrid was a single population. We're aiming to collect, um, we aim to collect 10, pop, 10 individuals per population, um, which, which we thought was actually quite a good thing to do. So this is where we get a little bit technical here. So first of all, I'll explain is that cycads being really old, um, they have been able to adapt to many environmental conditions. Surviving for 250, 200, 250 million years is a feat in its own right. Um, but what cycads are, so if we think about the human genome, the human genome is super complex, um, but the human genome is only about say, it's about 3.84 gigabase pairs. Um, from size-wise, which is quite a big genome. Now, Cycas has the smallest genome of all the Cycads, and this ranges from 25 to 30 gigabytes space. So that's significantly larger than the human genome. And some genera of Cycads, for example, Encephalatus, go all the way up to about 68 gigabytes space. So this is a huge genome. So what does this genome mean? It means that these organisms, have, as they've evolved, in order to combat um, things such as population, um, effects of population inbreeding or reduced population size, they basically doubled the genome. They doubled the genome size, mostly the, um, the elements from the nuclear genome, which allows them for more spot evolution. So what I mean by that is that although, so for example, in a species, we can have a lot of plasticity, we can, and this is based on the genome. It doesn't mean there's genetic differentiation between the, 
between the species. There's just a lot of morphological differentiation within a single species, and this is relevant to that. So the thing is to sequence that entire genome, that all that genetic information within the organism, um, you're looking around probably around 250,000 US dollars um, to sequence that, which is absolutely not achievable in this. So what we had to use is we had to develop a technique. Well, we looked at previous techniques which are already developed. One which is called this thing called RADC just here, which is called restriction site associated DNA sequencing. So what you're doing is, is you're getting the DNA from the organism and you're using some enzymes and those enzymes kind of fragment and kind of um, digest the, the, the genome in little parts and little fragments. And then what you do, you get lots of little size fragments. And then what you're doing is through these little magnetic beads, um, you're actually selecting a size range of these fragments. In our case, <coughs> between two and 600 base pairs in size. And then we're basically adapting little identifiers onto these on a molecular level um, to be able to sequence them. And so it means that we can effectively get this really big genome down and actually make it sequenceable and actually make it so we can get information throughout that genome. And so we can have information throughout that's both what we call neutral or non-neutral markers. So sites that are involved in natural selection and sites that aren't involved in natural selection, which sometimes can be relevant for this. So this is a little bit more of Psychos calcicola. So this is kind of going to give you kind of the results of what we found in Psychos calcicola itself. This is a species that I'm actually quite fond of. It's a very, very nice species. So, okay. So there's a few numbers here, but I'm not going to talk about the numbers here. I'm just going to, so what we found in calcicola, we found very low levels of gene diversity. So what we mean by this is when I say low gene diversity, which you can see here, this means that for, if we wanted to randomly get um, two um, genetic markers that are different from a population based on this gene diversity, we've got between a 2.3% chance and 11.6% chance of randomly pulling two markers that are different from a, from, from a population, which is incredibly low. Very, very low chances of very low genetic diversity. The other thing we, we found an ex, a very low number of individuals that were um, that had unique genes as well, heterozygotes, and that is a big problem as well in the population because that reduces the potential adaptive ability of the population itself. And then we have very high levels of inbreeding. I'll give you an example here. So we have the values here of say 0 0.244 to 0 0.64. So if this value is at zero, yeah, this would mean that a population is within something called the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So the population is equally um, outbreeding as well as, in, well as inbreeding. All individuals are randomly mating in a population. Of course, that very rarely happens. So when we have those values at plus one, it means we have complete inbreeding. If we have minus one, we have complete outbreeding. So from 0 0.24, you could theoretically say you've got 24 to 60% individuals that are inbreeding in the population, which is very high. So that means is that we've only, we've only got a few reproductive individuals that are actually um, on a regular basis contributing to um, new individuals, which is actually quite normal for cycads because cycads are dioecious, so they have separate male and female plants. Um, and it, some species of cycads take, can take up to 60 years to produce the first cone, and then it can cone every seven years. So you can imagine this is quite a, quite a, a low generation time. Um, and because of this, it means that often you've probably got a single female within a year or within a two or three year period that's producing a cone. And that's next to those same, those same male plants. Not only that, is the pollinators really travel more than a few meters from a plant. So really travel between populations. So these plants need to be very close. And also the seeds of cycads, especially in Australia, um, are not known to travel any greater than 10 meters, which is pretty poor, um, mainly because their potential distributors of these seeds are pretty died out. And this would really explain this high inbreeding in them. Um, 
We also found that, um, that generally um, for Calcicola, that the wild populations had a higher level of diversity than found in the cultivated populations, particularly populations on the Litchfield National Park were completely um, not available in cultivation at all. Um, which is quite relevant. So this is this was quite interesting for us. So because anything from Litchfield is not known, it means that we've got a significant portion of that genetic diversity um, that's not included in the wild populations and not conserved in cultivation. Um, and overall, this indicates um, evidence of inbreeding depression. So what we've got just here, this is a it's a principal component. Um, and what we've got here, you can see the individual, into each dot represents an individual. The line represents from where it is to the center. And this circumference represents generally the diversity mostly that's there. So we can see just here, we have um, the Litchfield National Park. This is part of Litchfield as well. And this here, we have both Daly River and Spirit Hills in the brown. And on the other side of us, this is the Catherine region. So you can see based on this, there is definitely a differentiation there between what's in the Catherine region and what's in, um, in the, the other one. So if you go back to the map itself, um, you can see here, so this is where we've got in the um, Litchfield, Litchfield National Park and then the Catherine region populations come down here at the bottom. I'm assuming you guys can see my mouse moving. Great, okay, that makes it a little bit easier. Let's just go back to where it was. Um, and yeah, and that's one of the big take home messages. So we do have a significant, so there was definitely, well, so when we look at geography and we look at genetic diversity, there was a correlation between that. So genetic diversity confirmed the separation between these two regions. However, there was still only a 6% on a, on a statistical basis, still only a maximum of a 6% differentiation between these regions. Um, so it indicates that there's definitely evidence of gene flow that's being reduced between these two regions, which we can come into in the next slide. So this next slide just here, this looks quite confusing, this slide it does, but this is a typical kind of plot we use for population genetics. So I'll explain this to you. So each individual block represents an individual. Um, and when we've got one color, each color represents a potential genotype. Um, and you can see here where I've got K2 highlighted. So this means the, most, the highest probability is that we have two groups here. So we have a blue group and a red group. And we can see here the blue group, this is the Litchfield National Park populations. And we also have a blue group just here, which is Daly River and Spirit Hills. And we have the red group here, which is Catherine. Now, what we don't see here is we don't see that much red within the blue and we don't see that much blue within the red except here, which is indicating um, there's a lack of what we call admixture. So we have a lack of gene mixture between these two groups. Generally, these other groups that's shown here is K3, K4, K5. Um, they are not statistically supported, but they're still showed as part of this plot because this plot's actually quite important for population genetics. So what we're seeing here is that Catherine is quite unique in this entity, but there is still evidence of some gene flow there. Um, and Daily River and Spirit Hills um, are closer genetically to the Litchfield populations than they are to Catherine, which makes sense from a geographic basis. Um, but there's no evidence of recent gene flow from, this, from, from, our, from our results itself. And there's no evidence of recent migration of individuals from one population to the others, which indicates that whatever we've got here is differentiation or genetic diversity between, it's been from a very long time ago. So potentially these populations in the Catherine have been, have been segregated for maybe um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. But because of the slow rate of evolution in cycads, it's not yet trickled down into the genetics. So we're not seeing the genetic signal of this differentiation we're starting to, but we haven't seen it properly. So could this indicate that in the future, Calcicola will speciate? Well, there's gonna be no more gene flow between them because between where the populations were to where they are now, 
all the other populations are extinct. There was originally a Birim specimen, you see, collected. I can show you, go back to that map really quickly. Um, between this, these populations in the Litchfield region and the Catherine, there were populations distributed along this area. However, when we actually went to collect, those populations weren't there anymore. They were either farmland or road um, or housing estates and things now. So it's very likely the habitat has just been removed from these, which means they would have been some kind of connection there. However, for this to be showing as it is now, um, indicates that this breakage between the populations happened before we intervened um, significantly. So it was already happening. And, we was all, and this is potentially due to climate changes, climate change, and many other scenarios it could be. We don't exactly know the true answer to that. And now we come into this Sarkis Armstrong complex. I want to call this a complex here, I am, because I'm going to, because there's a lot of morphological similarity between Armstrong and McConaughey. And the conclusions of what we see here kind of do kind of raise some quite important questions. So again, Armstrongi, it's another nice species. And you can see from these two images, Armstrongi and McConaughey do look differentiated. But I can tell you that if you, this is from two extremes. When you look at some populations of these species, um, individuals look very similar. And what, is defi and what defines them on a morphological basis, based on descriptions, um, is not always true when it comes to the populations there. Um, it's very likely that these, it's, the hybrid definitely shares similarities between both extreme potential morphotypes here, but we can see what the genetic shows us here. So again, a lot of numbers, but very low. This, this gene diversity is lower than Psychos calcicola. So that's, this is between a, this is between like a 0.6 and 0.5% chance of randomly pulling two, two unique markers from a population. Sorry, that's something in the chat. Okay, sorry, it's a survey. Um, yeah, so those values are really low and I'm not trying to be complex by showing these numbers, but um, it's, it's, it's a pretty low estimation of diversity. And what we were, well, for example, if we look at say, in the majority of mammals and chimps, you're probably looking at a value of, um, of maybe 20, 23 to maybe 40% or 50, 60 to 60% even, you see, not within, not within the 5% region. It's, this is exceptionally low. And it just really tells us a lot about the diversity here. And strangely in Armstrongi, we have mostly outbreeding occurring. So it means that individuals are actually um, breeding out with other populations more than their inbreeding, which is quite um, unique and quite different. Um, and this would explain, if we look at the distribution for Armstrongi really quickly and McConaughey, um, McConaughey, what we, ha we have here is distributed mainly within the Cox Peninsula. There are some populations over near the West Australian border, but we didn't manage to sample them. When Armstrongi has got quite a wide distribution in the Tiwi Islands um, and the Cox uh, and around the Darwin region, which is which is quite important to know. Go back to where we were. Um, and so what we're finding is is that outbreeding in McConaughey, so so uh, Armstrongi, sorry, so they're outbreeding with other populations and in uh, and in McConaughey, it's mostly inbreeding. So they're inbreeding within that population itself. We can see here the Armstrongi. Uh, Sorry, the mouse is kind of, the, the values are kind of skewed slightly. But still, overall, the average genetic diversity for both species is exceptionally low. It is. So it's what we're seeing overall is, um, I'll be honest with you, when I wanted to look at cycads in Australia, so cycads generally as a whole show very low levels of genetic diversity. However, this is mostly due to the populations that are under severe threat fragmentation, removal of individuals and things. And we was expecting that within Australia, that we would see something a lot higher levels of genetic diversity 
than we are doing, which is, which is not great, actually. It really says something about the populations and the psychids as a whole, that they're showing such low levels of genetic diversity, which is indicating something that's happening to them, that they're just not really breeding fast enough, or they're not able to adapt fast enough, which is a big problem for them. So this is the question we come to. So when we look at Psychos Armstrong and Psychos McConaughey and the hybrid population, we have almost no differentiation between these species at all. There's actually no differentiation between the populations as a whole and no differentiation between the species um, and very little di genetic diversity. When we look at the next plot, it's just a complete um, yeah, so this is basically what I'm saying here is this molecular data isn't really supporting um, two separate species here and a hybrid between them. Yes, okay, theoretically, this group of hy supposed hybrid populations is potentially a little bit more differentiated from both those species, but we have individuals from all over the place within these. And when we look at the actual structure plot itself, this is a really big one, I'm afraid to say, but all we have to look at is this top line and this top line all we have is one so there's just one genotype that's running through these species and the question is is that why could this be why can how can you get no genetic structure um no evidence of recent migration no differentiation between populations no differentiation between the species in this case which is exactly what you kind of don't want to see but this is how it is with this is what we've got with these species and this is using a lot of data and I think the most likely scenario is is there is evidence to point towards that the indigenous peoples did use the seeds from farm Armstrong and McConaughey and they distributed those seeds in as a food source or as carrying them with them between the Tiwi Islands the mainland Australia and I suppose that in many cases they wouldn't necessarily differentiate um, McConaughey and Armstrong if they were different species they would just be collecting the seeds and using the seeds or creating um, as South Africa do creating a bread or a starch from those seeds and um, although those seeds are kind of poisonous but they don't necessarily you don't always realize that till later in life if you ingest in cycad seeds um, there's a really good paper on that on cycad in eating cycad seeds called Island of Colorblind and it's about, pop, it's about groups of people in the Ruku Islands of Japan eating the, the sago from Cycas revoluta, not the actual sago palm, but it's called the Cycas revoluta. And where it's causing early onset Alzheimer's and blindness um, in these populations from eating these seeds. But here what we've got is we've got no differentiation at all within these species, no very little genetic diversity. Um, it's, a, it's a question. It, makes you think about what's really happening here and I think the most likely case scenario is is that these seeds have just been moved around and they've lost that genetic structure when we looked at the the actual populations if I go back one which you can't really see here um, but when we looked at these some of these individuals from Armstrongy from the Tiwi Islands are right in right next to the population of the Litchfield, Litchfield National Park um, genetically and um, they're not really differentiated from that mainland which is it's a bit unique so what can we kind of conclude this so overall we've got very low genetic diversity and um, inbreeding in these species as a whole um, really what this says is that this such low levels of genetic diversity means that these organisms have got a very low adaptive probability of adapting to future changes and things because they just don't have that genetic diversity there in the first place. Organisms to be able to adapt need that level of genetic. However, they do have a huge genome and there is still a possibility that there is a lot of morphological change that can happen, sorry, a lot of change that can happen in that big genome. Um, but still, that big genome is very repetitive in this case. There's no recent gene flow, but there is evidence of gene flow in the past, particularly in Psychos calcicola. And for all the species, 
and especially Council Canada, what we see that differentiation between the populations, it's very likely this is not yet reflected in the genome. And for Cycas calcicola, this is repeated, sorry. <laughs> um, the populations are um, not represented in cultivation. And for Cycas armstrongi and McConaughey, we found no differentiation between the species themselves. And not only was there no differentiation between these species, um, we can't really, based on morphology and molecular data, we find no support to support McConaughey as a separate species to Armstrongi. And that also goes with the recognized subspecies of Sacus Armstrongi. Or McConaughey, sorry. Armstrongi doesn't have any subspecies, it's just a singular one. Does anybody have any questions or want me to explain anything in a little bit more detail? All right, Th thanks so much, James. I'm just going to stop the recording now and then we can take the questions.